Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our colloquium series. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. John Seymour, who runs the uh, Translational Biomimetic Bioelectronics Lab at UT Health and Rice University. Um, he was recently awarded the University of Texas STARS Award and a $7 million translation grant to study the human brain. Prior to jo joining UT Health, Dr. Seymour served as research faculty in the Department of Electrical Engineering at the University of Michigan. And his industry experience, uh, where, where in that uh, uh, capacity, he uh, developed novel neural interfaces, including stretchable bioelectronics and optogenetic mapping tools. Um, his industry experiences um, includes working at NeuroNexus as principal scientist, and he was part of the leadership team when NeuroNexus was acquired by Great Batch Medical. He earned his, PhD, his, his BS uh, with honors in electrical physics from the Ohio State University and master's and PhD in biomedical engineering from University of Michigan. Um, it's our great pleasure to have you here, John. Thank you, Azada. All right. It is truly an honor to be here at such a storied institution. And, and yeah, I've been looking forward to this. Um, so, but as soon as I sent Asa the, the title, I thought, oh, that's kind of cheeky, right? Some of you might be thinking, uh, excuse me, I didn't know uh, design for neural electrodes ever died, uh, which is perfectly fair. Uh, but I think the, the, the feeling I've had in the past, and I've uh, been in this space for a while now, designing electrodes, um, is that, you know, has it fallen into that, in Pasteur's quadrant, has it fallen into sort of the Ed Edison quadrant where it's just about sort of the engineering and sort of pushing the envelope on the manufacturing side? Um, and so I think some of that is true. But also, it turns out there are a lot of interesting problems yet to be solved. And so my challenge today is to try and show you some of those and hopefully convince you it's uh, still an exciting space to be in. I'll start out by introducing the team. So uh, we are at the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston. Um, I also have a joint appointment at Rice Electrical Engineering. Um, part of the Neural Engineering Initiative. Very exciting to be there. Um, of course, Rice is well known for their excellent uh, engineering infrastructure, engineering talent. Uh, so it's, it's been really good for the lab. Uh, our space is actually on Rice's campus with the other NEI faculty. Um, and across the street from Rice is Texas Medical Center, which is also super exciting because uh, it's the world's largest medical center full of clinicians who are looking to make an impact in this space. Uh, but because my home is neurosurgery, uh, you might imagine that uh, we're under a little bit of pressure to deliver to neurosurgeons, which colors the way you see neurotechnology development. And we'll talk about that a, a bit. Um, so in academia, this is a smattering of some of the work that we've done. And I would say, the focus has been single unit activity. Um, and there's a lot of, I think, great work in this space. And you know, I've uh, been a, a strong proponent of making things very, very small, flexible, biomimetic, and really pursue the angle of single cell activity, studying the microcircuit, whether you're stimulating uh, with optics or you're recording with electrical tools. Um, and I think that this, this is wonderful. Uh, but there is a space out there where the clinicians uh, prefer to operate, and these are larger devices, and I want to talk about some of the advantages that, that come uh, in that domain. So I think it's useful to uh, contrast some of this. You've, you've seen the single cell tools. Uh, this is the net probe on the left, and Chong Shi and Lan Luan, who you probably know about. Uh, they make really arguably the most biomimetic single cell device that's out there. And then on the far right, you have the sort of the largest devices. And there's this demarcation between what the clinicians use and what the neuroscientists prefer to use. Um, and I would say that uh, every one of these tools has a lot of value. 
Um, even the U probe, if, you, if you're not familiar with the U, U probe, uh, it's probably because you're not you know, used to sort of the macaque, uh, the primate recording space. These have been very effective in the neuroscience of, of primates. And so they all have their, their strength. And I think one thing that uh, is obvious, even to this really rough scale uh, array of, of technologies, is that they vary greatly in terms of size. And so if I asked you a softball question, which is, which of these is least invasive? And I pause, and I, I bet you half of you just went to the far left, and maybe some of you went to the far right. Right, so the ECOG device, maybe I should point. So this ECOG device is not penetrating the brain. So you could argue this is the least invasive of the technologies. I was surprised uh, in talking to neurosurgeons that they make the argument that this depth array, uh, commonly called the stereotactic electroencephalogram, the SEG, is the least invasive. And this is a little bit surprising. But it depends on your metric. So if your metric is histology, and you're going to section tissue, and you look at new and you look at GFAP and ED1, and you ask, who, where's the, the largest tissue response? I think the, you know, this is going to look good. And obviously, you, you should get almost no effect here, except maybe near the superficial areas. Um, so here's how the argument goes. And rather than explain the surgery to you, it is so fast that I'm just going to show you. Let's see if I can get this started. There we go. Forgive the advertisement. This is not intended to promote PMT products. <laughs> but they made this nice video of Dr. Tandon, uh, who happens to be my chair and the neurosurgery department and the director of our epilepsy center. So he just put in a drill bit into this bushing. The bushing's being held by a robot. Uh, so he's, at this point, the scalp and the skull are untouched. He's drilling through both. That little cylinder you see right around here, this is just a, a, a stop. Um, so at this point, he's got to remove the drill bit, um, and then he's going to coagulate uh, the dura matter. So this is just delivering high frequency current. Uh, it has no damage to neurons, uh, ablates the, the dura matter, uh, and makes sort of a, a low resistance path uh, for the, the probe to go in. And so at, at this point, uh, what he slid in there was the anchor, and the anchor is going to screw into the skull. You can see some from previous SEGs. So just to remind everybody, this is the SEG surgery. And just about in a minute, you're going to see a little bit of blood. So if you want to look away, no worries. OK, so that he's going to move the robot out of the way. Now that the anchor bolt's in place, he has a means to hold that trajectory. The really nice thing about these bushings is they hold that trajectory. And that trajectory was mapped the day before. right? So they know where they're going. They program the robot. It's going to go to each of these. And that really helps uh, ensure you, you're going to hit your target. And so. Currently, there's no invasive, uh, besides the dura mater, nothing's been invasive. This is a guide wire, so it's not the probe. And then, now he just created a low resistance path for the device to follow. So that was a stainless steel guide wire about 800 microns across. And so just by hand, because you have this anchor, you have a nice trajectory to follow, and you have that low impedance path, he's going to uh, lower that in and uh, tighten it to the anchor bolt. And that device is done. And it was two minutes. And on average, uh, publications have, have predicted about six minutes um, for this kind of surgery. And uh, is that clear? Any questions about how that works? And so for epilepsy diagnosis, this has been really the, one of the most effective uh, tools. And back to this question of invasiveness. Um, so if, if your metric is, is how safe is it for the patient? It certainly helps to be fast. It's not the only metric. Uh, there's some other very important ones. The alternative to the SEG for epilepsy patients for a very, very long time has been the ECOG grid. And the argument being that it's less invasive. Uh, but of course, it's hard to put a cost function on what happens to remove skull and meninges. 
So skull and meninges are very vascularized, and removing them does cause uh, a risk to these other events. So we see a higher uh, a percentage of, of lesions, hemorrhaging, and infections. And the outcome for the procedure, uh, reasonably so, was uh, these patients had a greater degree of seizure freedom. That's the advantage of the depth array, right? It's reaching the target that you're trying to study. With ECOG, you're forced to measure from a distance. So lots of reasons, I think, to be encouraged by this. And there's literally dozens and dozens of papers from clinics all across the world now comparing the, uh, the depth array to ECOG. And I think so, and that technology is actually 25, 30 years old. It started in France, and it's taken a while to propagate. But one reason depth arrays have really taken off is because we have uh, more ubiquitous MRI, so you know where the large blood vessels are before implantation, so that's lowering risk. Um, and you have robots to assist and, uh, again, increase the speed of, of the implantation. But another motivation certainly has to be that we have a lot of buried cortex, a lot of buried gray matter. And in this graph in the top right, you see a comparison of the amount of area you have to remove of skull and meninges when performing an ECOG, a standard ECOG versus the SEG. And this assumes you're implanting 10 SEGs. But each one of those twister holes was about 2.1 millimeters in diameter. Uh, so if there is a cost function to removing skull and meninges, uh, which I think you argue from the literature there should be, then uh, SEG is looking really good right now. And this is a graph of how much cortical area you have access to, not to mention all the other deep brain structures in the thalamus that you have access to. Uh, so 70% of your cortex is buried. Uh, so hopefully that was the argument for that particular form of technology is safe, uh, efficacious, and it can reach any volume. Now, it's certainly not without its own uh, sets of challenges. And you don't really see SEG at the forefront of, say, brain-computer interfaces. So um, it's been great for seizure detection. And there's a lot of asynchrony in seizure detection. So those are really good tools uh, for measuring that, those events. But as you can see from the graph, and uh, you might have seen graphs like this uh, in the past, comparing electrophysiology versus bold technologies in the green, uh, which are known, you know, are limited by their, their speed. And uh, these two are obviously invasive. So these are the trade-offs that surgeons have to make. But I want to point your attention to that gap, right? This is something I, I've, I've come to calling the mesoscale gap. And that area, the way I would think about it, is this 200 micron to 5 millimeter range. Right? So what happens when we're recording in that space? Are we resolving a lot of information? And can we do better? So one model in your head that I think would be useful is if you, if you look here, right? So the brain, the, cortical, uh, the cortex is made up in some places of a lot of cortical columns. And those dimensions tend to be in that 200 to 400 micron space. And then you've got you know, local networks also in that range. And obviously, we want to be able to extract information from those ranges. And right now, this, is, this has been challenging. So we'd like to go from the ring electrode, which is certainly not recording at the resolution of a cortical column, into that mesoscale space. So let's talk about field potentials. Let's try and make sense of that. And uh, I'm going to review LPs very quickly for you. Uh, I know when I was a graduate student, I remember asking neuroscience friends, what is the field potential? What's the local field potential? And there's a lot of uh, challenges there. There's a lot of myths and misunderstandings uh, and some great research on that. I would argue that one of the best sources for clarity when you're trying to understand the field potential is to look at the physics papers and the modeling papers. And so uh, first thing I'll say is the field potentials are not driven by action potentials. Right? They're driven by those postsynaptic currents and primarily the synchronous postsynaptic currents. But let's explain. So here's a model, and, and folks have been using dipole moments for a long, long time. Um, Einho, Einho, Gal, Einho, um, 
has published dozens and dozens of paper, uh, papers in this space. Uh, this is a more recent one, and I really enjoy this one. So he's using the Yale program neuron, and he's created this wrapper called LPY. And in it, uh, he's going to apply a current in this layer, uh, layer 2-3 pyramidal cell. And you see from the arrow, the current goes here into the postsynaptic terminal. And because of the law of neutrality, current has to flow out, right? So the opposite, the uh, same amount of charge is flowing out of the cell. And because of the structure of the cell, right, you've got sort of equal current flowing out, but the structure is such that when current flows into the apical dendrites, which it often does in these cell types, you have current flowing out of the basal dendrites. And that generates, in physics, what we call a dipole moment, right? And the dipole moment uh, is current times distance or charge times distance. Uh, but take a, a minute here, and, and uh, this is a voltage contour of this event in time. Uh, so it, it does create what you would expect to see from a dipole moment. And there's more spatial res resolution in this version of it, which is thousands of cell segments, than you see here. And so in this particular model, he's replaced all of those dipole moments with the cumulative sum. Um, and this, if you're trying to make an efficient computation of local field potentials, that's still thousands, you know, tens of thousands of cells you need in your model. So this is a great way to make, a, you know, a simplification. And uh, one of the objections of the paper is to justify this. At what scale is this a fair uh, approximation? And so let's zoom out. Notice here that this is one millimeter. We're going to zoom out. And uh, at this scale, they look identical. So this is great news if you want to study field potentials sort of in the mesoscale and at the macro scale. That's an important point. It's uh, you know, obviously less accurate at the micro scale. And the last thing I want you to remember, because this is such an easy thing to sort of think about when you're trying to understand what the field potentials are doing, and that is that what you're measuring are current dipole moments. And those are completely biased towards structure and synchrony. So you see from here, if there was no structure, if it was a stellate neuron, you would not be able to measure it at distance. Right? It only works when D is large. And so LFPs and all other field potentials are very biased. And if you're thinking of EEGs, then obviously they're even more biased than just the local field potential. Not that the bias is, is, is always a bad thing. Um, I like to, to read this uh, really famous Buzaki paper. Uh, and let me highlight a couple parts. I think it's worth reading. We foresee that the spatially resolved wideband LFP signal, which contains information about both afferent patterns and assembly outputs, may turn out to be the most useful signal for understanding neuronal computations. Um, so that a couple things worth noting is spatially resolved, right? That phrase, I think, is, is really important. And then, obviously, for everything we do as electrical engineers, we're thinking, what it, we should be thinking, what is the information capacity of this particular tool? So that holds promise. Now, uh, back to this mesoscale gap issue and the challenges of microelectrodes. Uh, indulge me for a minute. Let's think about uh, a cocktail party problem. And uh, you know, we, we, we just discussed dipole moments. This is a mesoscale space about five millimeters by six millimeters. And you see these dipole moments out here that are representative of currents that you would see in uh, a, a, an accurate scale of, of a brain. Um, and the, the magnitude of that current dipole moment is also represented by the area, the, the volume of tissue it would take to generate a current dipole moment of that magnitude. And the question is, uh, again, if, if the objective is to maximize information output, then we need a good signal to noise ratio with each of these sources. Now, if you have a technology like this, which is basically a microelectrode, in this case, we have electrodes pointing in every direction. And if you made such a structure, you probably made it for this reason. Right? This is your recording volume right here. If B, the band that you're studying, 
is high frequency. So, so think 300 to 3,000 hertz, right? This is where you're recording, and you cannot see beyond that. But the good news is, in that volume, you have excellent signal-to-noise ratio, and therefore, you have very good information channels. And the other real advantage of spikes sorting, single cell recording, is that you can discriminate information channels. That's what the spike sorting is for. So it's super powerful. This is why I think single cell tools get a ton of attention, rightfully so, right? Um, but obviously, if we could also include this network information into our study, wow, that'd be powerful. And you know, I, I should phrase it as a question. Can we record from these? And uh, any, anybody have a comment, uh, su suggestion? Can you record from these? The answer is, is yes. And here's the, here's the beauty of the microelectrode. It's also the burden of the microelectrode. It can record everything that a macro scale recording electrode can see. Absolutely everything. So microelectrodes record at the micro scale here. So uh, we talked about single units, but there's also field potentials happening at that scale. So if you're doing current source density analysis, they're showing up in this level. They're seeing everything in your mesoscale space. And they're seeing that everything you're, if you had a nearby uh, EEG electrode would see. Um, plus, it's seeing all the noise. And this is one of the challenges of, of microelectrodes. It's picking up electromagnetic interference. So uh, in this band of, say, 1 hertz to 300 hertz, we see a lot of information. And the real issue is, how do you interpret that? Do you have dis uh, spatially uh, discrimination, spatial discrimination, and a clear SNR for an information channel? So that's the challenge. And I think if, if I change the analogy and really sort of uh, focus on this cocktail party problem, I think you would all see a, a potential solution. And that is, replace every dipole moment with a person, and replace every electrode with a microphone. And then how would you design that? What kind of microphone would you put on this recording array? Right, the, the really cool thing about microphones is, right, it's a really rich set of products out there. So the engineers have been you know, working on various microphones for, for decades, and you can buy them with varying degrees of directionality. So you would obviously pick a microphone that's very directional. Uh, and you, you would certainly not pick an omnidirectional microphone. OK, so the last point I want to make about this slide is that what we want is to understand the, these polar sensitivity maps of our electrodes. That's the first thing. Um, and then obviously, we want to spatially resolve uh, this mesoscale space. It's, I, I think, be highly impactful to neuroscience if we could do that. So I want to show you a very famous neuropixel uh, probe. And to understand the, the sort of the polar plots, the first thing you would have to do is look at the lead fields. And you can generate those yourself. Uh, probably you all have access to ComSol or you have access to ANSYS. And so if you drive current through your electrode, you are effectively making the lead field. And so uh, when you hear the word lead field, which is kind of an ancient term now, uh, just think sensitivity map. Right? What is the sensitivity of this particular electrode? And if you zoom way in, you actually see the cardioid shape that we saw for microphones, right? Uh, and this is not actually news. This was first published, I think, in 2004, also from the University of Michigan. Uh, but if you zoom out, you get a circular shape. Uh, and of course, if you have a ring electrode, then by definition, you should be seeing a circular shape. Uh, so let me introduce a device we call disk for directional and scalable array. And there's nothing particularly novel about the, the way we make it. So in a clean room, we'll make a thin film array, and then we'll wrap it around the cylinder. Uh, the, the useful combination here is if you have microscale electrodes, you have sort of mesoscale substrate or insulation body. And the insulation body is really going to do something uh, different to the current here. Uh, and you can see if you stimulate through this electrode marked with black, you get uh, an asymmetric pattern. 
And just to prove the point, if you simulate on the back side, you get a very different pattern. And so let's look at all three of these sort of on the same polar plots. The spatial scales here are a little bit off, but the, uh, the, the gain field uh, or the lead field is exactly the same color scale across these three. And those circles represent the 0.8 millimeter and the 1.5 millimeter uh, distance from each electrode. So our polar plots look like this. And you can see the NorPixel probe in orange and the uh, SEG in green and the cardioid shape uh, in disk. And we'll talk about why in, in just a few slides. But as you zoom out, then it's approaching a circular pattern, right? So it's less effective, particularly at like five millimeters. It's looking like a circle. And so when the insulating body is 800 microns, this tends to be uh, a great way to study the, the mesoscale. Uh, before I show you too many models, I've been told by colleagues, like, I don't really trust models. Can I see some EFIS? And uh, so we'll get to the study in a minute, but this is th that device implanted into a rat barrel cortex. And uh, the, the evoked potential is strongest here and about 180 degrees away, it's uh, lowest amplitude. And we'll come back to that. But I have to force a little bit more modeling on you. Bear with me. Okay, so let's go back to that, that kind of standard 70 micron diameter structure with electrodes on it. And instead of looking at the gain map, let's just look at an example dipole moment, uh, one millimeter away. Um, and then what we're going to do in this experiment is vary the diameter of the insulating body. Same electrodes, uh, same gap distance. And so you actually see some directionality here. It's about a plus or minus 10% difference. And by the way, the current that you're driving through this dipole, dipole uh, is, uh, is indeterminate of the shape of, of that graph. OK, but if you switch over to the, the larger substrate, now suddenly there's a large peak. And this dotted line is important. The dotted line is the shape you would get if the insulating body were completely conductive, matched the brain tissue. And the reason that it still has a hump, obviously, is the back electrode, you're pushing it further away. So you're fixing the gap. And in this case, you have to push the back electrode away. And so some of this is coming from this, you know, the, the fact that the, you've got a, a greater distance between the two. Uh, but the other part is being driven by this phenomenon some people call substrate shielding. OK. And I'll show you, uh, I think, a really interesting connection. So here is the uh, lead body diameter. We're starting at uh, just at zero and working our way up to uh, 1.4. 1 1.4 1 is still a clinically relevant device diameter. So if you're in the neuroscience world and you're working with rodents, you're thinking, wow, all of these are really big. Uh, but the neurosurgeons, they're all working in this space here. And the exciting thing is this is an exponential relationship. Part of what's happening is due to the, the distance of that back electrode. But a very significant part is what's happening to the perturbation of the electric field. And the presence of the insulating body is forcing the current to take the shortest path to the reference, and that is far away from the device. And so this isopotential that sits right in front of the device, it is as if your electrode is taking a couple steps toward the source and the same void happens in the back. You can, uh, it's actually not a very good figure. Uh, this is, a, by the way, all online, so we have more, a, a lot more modeling, if you like modeling, uh, showing that the, the back electrode effectively is moving even further away. And that explains the exponential rise in this effect. Now, obviously, there's probably a limit to how big the device should be. Uh, but there's this uh, interesting to, to note. OK, so I do want to convince you that there's actually some in vivo results uh, behind this. This is a picture of the device. Uh, we like to use the rat barrel cortex. And so if you stimulate the whiskers, should get an evoked potential and a barrel field. Uh, if we were really sophisticated, we'd probably use uh, intrinsic optical imaging. But 
our, in our approach here, we're just targeting C1. Sometimes you have to move around the vessels and you don't exactly know where it is. So in some of the rats, we'll do histology and I'll show you those results too. So we knew where we were um, in three of these rats, but there were nine, nine rats total. Just to give a sense of scale, this is the depth of the rat barrel cortex. Okay. Um, so in all the data I'm about to show you, there's four comparisons. The first thing you do in this experiment is implant the tetrode. It's minimally invasive. It's not going to cause a lot of bleeding. Uh, you take your recordings in layer five, and then we Im implant this. And of course, when we started this, we thought, would this even work in a rat? <laughs> and it, if you try this, uh, for full disclosure, right? If you try this in a full craniotomy, you get a lot of dimpling. It's not a, you know, it's not a particularly good idea. Um, so if, for those of you who have implanted grin lenses, you probably have, have figured out the trick to this is to create a, a burr hole just larger than the, the size of the device because now what's happening is the meninges is connected to the skull, is connected to the brain, and these things are giving a lot more re, uh, resistance so you can pierce that with, with, with far less dimpling than you'd otherwise get. Um, and so now that you have disc, uh, there's a really cool trick. So virtually you create these ring electrodes. And these, this is a clinical SEG. Uh, so the, the devices we showed you earlier being implanted in humans, they have a two millimeter ring. So a lot of averaging going on there. Uh, so not surprising, you will see attenuation of the signals when we get there. And here's amplitude. The model predicted disk would have the largest amplitude. Um, and so you have the tetrode, the disk, and these two are virtual, and they're derived by averaging uh, virtual rings on the device itself. Uh, and so that was significant uh, across uh, all three comparisons. Uh, I won't go into this, but in the paper, we do spend a lot of time talking about multiscale. And the reason multiscale is important, particularly to clinicians, is they need the historical biomarkers, right? If you're an expert in, in studying field potentials, you're looking for particular patterns. Um, and so these large ring electrodes, they're averaging out a lot of the, uh, averaging away the local information and just giving you really synchronous uh, field potentials. And so they want, they want access to that data still. Uh, and so this is really important to them that, that we can do that. And so the model is, is trying to uh, uh, demonstrate that that this is a fair, uh, fair comparison. Okay, so the other thing the model predicted uh, is an improved signal to noise ratio. And across all four devices, we were able to show that. Uh, but the first thing, the first thing that you'll probably get from a neurosurgeon if you ever talk to one about your device, to, uh, about your device is, what is the noise floor, right? So this is always the challenge with with microelectrodes, um, and I think it's a very fair criticism. I do not think we're really at the level of, of, of these large ring electrodes. Uh, and so anyways, uh, I'm gonna have to speed up through here because there's one more topic I wanna get to. Um, so this is a single trial with no Faraday cage, uh, and the key point here is that you have to use common average referencing. Uh, if you don't, you, you, you you, you are challenged with a lot of noise. Uh, but the common average referencing is a, is a great trick, and I think it's even more effective in that particular mechanism. Uh, we looked at a lot of feature engineering, so you want to, if, if you're asking the question about information capacity, you want to know, are we detecting uh, information channels that allow us to make predictions about what was happened after the fact? Uh, so we ran this through uh, a number of, of classifiers but just using a standard linear discriminant analysis classifier, um, comparing 44 of the disk electrodes, there were 128, it was overkill. It was, you know, it was a, a vertical pitch of 200 microns, uh, completely uh, unnecessary. It did have slightly higher performance at 128 channels, but just a percent or two. Uh, 44 was great, and of course, you, you could uh, reasonably argue that, well, you're comparing 44 channels to the tetrode, which has four. So why would you make that comparison? And uh, I think 
it's important to compare it on the, you know, under, try to understand well, what's the information capacity on a per channel basis. So we looked at only the four channels in layer five and still had a significant improvement. Okay, um, I'm gonna skip this slide just for the sake of time and uh, briefly talk about manufacturing. So because of the noise issue, we're really interested in how do we increase the, the diameter of these electrodes. Um, and let me play this GIF. So the, the line on the left is following the GIF right now. And so there's an electrode that's growing on the front and the back. That electrode, um, if you look at the field around it, it's actually influencing the tissue. So what does, a, what does metal and tissue do? It acts as a float. It's trying to average, so it's trying to average all the voltages in front of it. But what it does, particularly in the ring, you see right when it formed the ring, you have this precipitous drop in your amplitude from this source. And the reason that it is, it's forcing it to be the average of the back and the sides and the front. And that's why rings are really detrimental to understanding sort of micro scale, meso scale, uh, information sources. Uh, but the good news from this is that you can do really well even in that sort of 100 to 200 micron uh, electrodiameter range. Uh, so there's some assembly techniques that uh, we talk about in the paper. Um, a lot has to be done. If you, if you really want to translate this, uh, even in, in macaques, what we're trying to do is reduce the electronics package and so I'd say half the lab is a question. Yeah, so when you said the 128 electrodes, uh -huh. how large were each one of those? Those were eight micron. Eight? Eight zero. Eight zero. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so we spent a lot of time working on the packaging problems. Um, and just to summarize, so we have uh, modeled an array that is predicted to be directional and scalable. Uh, it does increase the amplitude and the SNR. Uh, it, it did have higher information capacity per channel. Uh, we also showed directional current source density. Um, I would characterize the low noise as just okay. And uh, the disk electrodes can scale up as well as down, so they provide these historical biomarkers for the clinicians. Uh, five minutes? Five minutes, okay. So I wanna briefly talk about a couple applications. What do you do with directional field potential arrays? Uh, my lab is looking at speech BCI. We have funding for that. I think the challenging thing with, with speech is, is, the, is that the network is so large. If you have dysarthria or ALS, you actually have an intact network. But if you have aphasia, you have a disrupted network. And so future treatment of aphasia will require decoding from many brain regions at once. Very challenging, and I think that form factor, because it is multi-region, uh, will give us an advantage, or we hope. And uh, th this more recent project uh, allows us to look at focal epilepsy. Uh, but one thought I'll leave you with is, uh, imagine now you've got two of these so-called directional, mesoscale, field potential arrays. And say you want to study the hippocampus because it makes a, in, in, in the case of epilepsy, it makes a great model for temporal lobe epilepsy, which is very common in humans. If you have refractory epilepsy, it's probably in your hippocampus or in that temporal lobe region. And so folks have made these rat models uh, that are quite effective. Uh, so we have this, this funding to go after it, and we were quite shocked about how hard it was to figure out how to place two devices into one rat hippocampus. Uh, and this is a computationally challenging problem. Let me try to explain in just a couple minutes. So you all know what lead fields are now, these sensitivity maps. If you overlap two devices, if they're close enough to, together, those lead fields will interact with each other. Because you can montage them, this is not always a bad thing. These white spaces are when they cancel each other out. But remember, voltage is the superposition of all other voltages. And you can always add and subtract channels, as clinicians often do in EEG, and we call that montaging. Um, and so you can create a number of unique montages, and you have 
in this case, 256 channels uh, to work with. So it's a computationally challenging problem. But remember, if you're trying to do localization, uh, uh, you know, if you're outside and you're, you know, trying to, the satellites are trying to see your, your phone's trying to see the satellites, you need spatial diversity, right? If all the satellites were right there at the azimuth, you would not have any accuracy in your location. Same thing with lead fields. Um, and uh, forgive me, I have to go through here quickly, but the voltage uh, that you're recording is that gain vector. And remember, those are vectors. They're not a scalar value, it's the gain value dotted with the dipole moment that we talked about. So in this particular case, if you have a dipole moment sitting here, you would think, well, let's just pick the two closest electrodes if you want to maximize the voltage there. Um, that is not the case. Uh, you would need, uh, for example, uh, the red values uh, for that particular scenario. And uh, forgive me for rushing through here. I'll kind of leave you with this image. But you can analyze these, even with just two devices, we have found this to be a very challenging problem. And as you look ahead, as if we have tools that are directional in the mesoscale, and when two devices are better than one because of the field interactions and the montaging that's available to you, then uh, it will take a lot of uh, effort to optimize this, pro this solution uh, in an effective way. And you can imagine neurosurgeons, they will complain about the number of electrodes they have now. Not that they don't want more, but we're not sure with, you know, uh, how effective they will be without the right software tools. And so we definitely, definitely need software tools to complement devices, even on this scale of, say, 256 channels. I'm going to skip this one. And I'll leave you with the upshot, which is you shouldn't be bored with electro design and that field potentials, uh, as confusing as they can be at times, I think are a powerful way uh, to study the mesoscale. And when you're modeling this, it's important that you model the effect of your substrate, that you understand the sensitiv sensitivity map of your electrode, and you understand the interaction, uh, the possibilities of interacting with local electrodes in a, in a unique montage. And um, one, the one thing I did not have time to go into is that the biophysical components, that p-value, the di current dipole moment, is really important in predicting the information capacity that we have. And those models are getting better and better all the time. So uh, with that, I want to acknowledge the lab and my funding sources uh, and my collaborators. So thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Seymour. Any questions? Sorry. Please. Uh, so, so I'm a, originally a mechanical engineer by trade, so I'm definitely very interested in the manufacturing challenges of making these devices. Uh, I, I kind of missed that part a little bit, so I was just wondering. Oh yeah, I apologize for going through it. Um, we can make them much, much better, but w what we're doing now is a very conventional method of using polyimid, uh, the, the kind of polyimid that Thomas, Thomas Stieglitz has been using for decades. And so it's a metal, it's a uh, metal sandwich of, of polyimid. It's the uh, uh, micro HD Microsystems uh, 2611 series. Uh, we've tried some others. We've tried silicon carbide. We've tried dioxide. Uh, it turns out they're all pretty challenging. I personally do not think polyimid uh, is really a great solution to long-term long implantation in humans. So we are working on alternatives that have really better polymer-to-polymer -polymer adhesion. And even with you know, this kind of long, um, long history of polyimids in the space, I've talked to many, many other developers, and everyone struggles getting those things to work long term. And I think generally you're talking about like six months a year. I ask a question before. Uh, so um, I also like really enjoyed the you know, comp need for these computational models to um, basically plan for you know, implanting these um, electrodes. And so I was wondering, because uh, uh, for the SEGs right now, 
there are like multiple of them that are implanted for each yes. patient. How do they do the design right now? Like, how do they decide how to implant them now? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. So they have a hypothesis, of the, and it's not just the neurosurgeon, right? There's a whole team treating this patient uh, with, with uh, a really rich history of uh, behavior at the time of seizure. So they have hypotheses on where the onset is, and that's what's driving the placement. But they do have standard trajectories, in part because um, uh, they just know, they're looking for a set of patterns that they're familiar with, right? And so uh, generally it's between you know, 10 to 15 of these SEGs with up to 16 electrodes each. So there's, they still get a lot of information, 200 plus channels. Yeah, but it, it's, um, you know, I imagine it takes at least a, a couple hours, but many team meetings before they finally decide this process and they have software that helps them, et cetera. But they're using the MRI and the CT. The MRI you know, comes weeks before, the CT comes the morning of, and that makes the final sort of adjustment to that trajectory, trying to avoid large blood vessels in any eloquent brain regions. Um, and do we have any questions? Yes. Um, could you go a little bit more into the specific things that new software needs to do that, you know, something like Comsol isn't doing right now? Oh, yeah. yeah. So, I, again, it's the marriage of, so Comsol or Antis is giving you a lead field, okay? Um, and then you take something like Neuron, right? And when you scale that up, and there are a lot of groups trying to scale it up, LFPY is one example. Uh, we work with Salvador Dur Bernal, who, who has a NetPine version, which is a wrapper for Neuron. Um, the challenge is like making a good biophysical model. And so if you can perform, the, you know, solve that equation, which is simply voltage equals the gain dotted with the dipole moment, you can predict all your voltages, right? And you're, in a sense, you're trying to maximize SNR because that is predictive of the information capacity. Um, so I think that there's no software package that lets you do that together, so that would be useful. Um, but I think that maybe the hardest problem in that set of, of needs is an accurate biophysical model because what's driving the field potential, it's synchrony and it's structure. The good news is, you know, many, many famous group like the Allen Institute are developing really beautiful morphological definitions of cell types everywhere in your brain. And these libraries are all free online, so you just download all the cell types you want for that brain region. But what we are still missing synchrony, right? How do you define how much synchrony is happening at that space? And the biophysics models help at, at some time, but you need accurate inputs, et cetera. So if you have those things, then yeah, you, you could compute a form of information capacity. Maybe one, one last question I have is that, so for the um, epilepsy, so these electrodes are implanted temporarily, like for a week or so, once they find the focus of the seizure. Uh -huh. But for something like speech PCI that they're going to be, I imagine, implanted for long term, then what is the foreign body response to these? Like, Great point. So you will certainly have a, a much more, I think, um, uh, you would have a larger response zone. Uh, Patrick Ruther at Freiburg has published a paper with that particular diameter, 800 microns, uh, in macaques. Uh, and in that paper, they define sort of the uh, tissue, re the, the highly intense tissue response zone as 80 microns. I think that to me, that sounds wonderful. Why? <laughs> I would be expecting closer to 200 microns. Uh, so yeah, that, that is a challenge. Of course, if you ask the neurosurgeon, it's like, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, not the, it's not necessarily, uh, you know, and they're, of course, doing functional measures in these patients after every surgery. So they're looking for functional deficits, and they're not seeing it. Well, you know, one odd thing I found is if you only sort of live in the single unit space and you think about all the literature out there, the Utah Array has been in maybe 30 patients, right? But we literally have thousands and thousands of patients with dozens of electrodes each. <laughs> and it uh, passes over, but uh, yeah, and, and so the data looks really promising given, the, given all that information, clinical information. Well, thank you so much. And no, thank you. And thank you.